Welcome to the Money Metals Midweek Memo. News and commentary relating to sound money, the precious metals markets, and the economy. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. So, if you enjoyed the opening act, wait until you see the headliner. Now, I know opening bands can be hit or miss. Last summer, my wife and I went to see my favorite band, The Cure, and the opening act was a Scottish group called The Twilight Sad. I had never heard of them and really didn't have any expectations at all going in, but as it turned out, they are a fantastic band. I would pay money to go see them as a headliner. But of course, when it was all said and done, they were still nothing compared to The Cure. The Cure played for nearly four hours, knocked it out of the arena. Fantastic concert. I think this recent gold rally is a little bit like the Twilight Sad. Solid opening act, but it's going to have nothing on the main event. Gold scaled record highs last Friday, hitting $2,195 an ounce and gold futures have traded above $2,200. Now, here's a little perspective. Gold was up eight straight days as of Friday, and the rally really started back on February 29th. Between then and Friday, the yellow metal was up just over 7%. And for the first time, we're starting to see some institutional money move into gold. Now, I think it could easily move right back out, but for the time being, we are starting to see some mainstream bullishness on gold. As evidence to this, the CFTC's Disaggregated Commitments of Traders report, uh, shortened for the COTS report, kind of reveals this. For the week ending March 5th, money managers increased their speculative gross long positions in Comics Gold Futures by 41,221 contracts. And at the same time, short positions fell by 12,389 contracts. So the money is moving into the longs in the gold futures market. Now, one thing I find particularly interesting about all of this is that there really wasn't any significant news to drive this bull rally. Now, as with any big market move, multiple factors probably kicked the rally off. According to the mainstream narrative, it was renewed hope that the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates sooner rather than later. And I talked about this last week. It started with a relatively cool personal consumption expenditure price index report last week, and then it got a boost with some data that pointed to a slowing economy. Now, that PCE is the Fed's favorite inflation measure, and that's because it understates inflation the most, and it gives them the most wiggle room to claim victory over inflation. Fed Chair Jerome Powell uh, kept the rally going uh, last week with what were perceived to be pretty dovish remarks during his visit to Capitol Hill. Now, victory over inflation means easing off of those interest rates, and since gold is a non-yielding asset, a lower interest rate environment is typically considered bullish for gold. And this is why I say, if you liked the opening act, you're going to love the headliner. Now, keep in mind, the Fed didn't do anything. Fed officials didn't say they were going to do anything. Interest rates are still 5.5%. Monetary policy is still tight-ish. Well, actually, it's not, but everybody assumes it's tight. And yet, just the anticipation of the possibility of rate cuts pushed gold up 7%. Basically, gold climbed a wall of hope. So what's going to happen when the Fed actually does cut rates? And make no mistake, it is going to cut rates. Now, as I've explained in depth on past shows, I don't think they're going to cut rates because they beat inflation. And that's the narrative, right? Inflation's beat, we're going to have a soft landing, so we can go ahead and cut rates and everything is going to be hunky-dory. It's the Goldilocks scenario. I don't think that's what's going to happen at all. Inflation is alive and well, and I'll get to that here in a bit, but they are going to cut rates because this debt-riddled bubble economy cannot function in a high interest rate environment. So something's going to break, just like it did in 2008. I mean, in fact, something already broke, right? I mean, Monday was the anniversary of Silicon Valley Bank going under. Uh, The Fed managed to paper over that with a uh, bailout, 
But nevertheless, it did show the impact just very early on of this rate hiking and monetary tightening. By the way, the bailout program that was created in the wake of the uh, Silicon Valley bank failure ended on Tuesday. And interestingly, there were still a lot of banks tapping into that program. In fact, the amount of loans outstanding in the bailout program started spiking again last November. Now, some of that was banks taking what was basic or taking advantage of what was basically a sweetheart deal uh, because of the way the interest rates were. And uh, so they, they use that arbitrage to make a little bit of money. But you have to wonder how many of those banks were accessing that program out of necessity because they were having trouble. Now, with that backstop gone, wouldn't surprise me if we start to see some small banks shut down here in the near future. And the real test is going to come when those loans start to come due. And, you know, they still have time to repay those moving forward. But once they have to pay that money back, then what happens? Anyway, my point is something in the economy, something big is going to break. I mean, in fact, it's already broken, right? The Fed broke the economy years ago with artificially low interest rates and trillions of dollars printed out of thin air. We're just waiting for the shoe to drop, right? We're just waiting for that breakage to be revealed, uh, for the stress to make it completely collapse. And when that happens, we all know what the Fed will do. It will run to the economy's rescue. It will slash rates to zero. It will relaunch quantitative easing. Inflation be damned. They'll tell us it's an emergency and we'll worry about the ramifications after the emergency is over. It will unleash another tsunami of easy money because that's what the Fed does. There's no indication anywhere that it would do anything different. There's no indication, nothing to make you think that if the economy starts to collapse tomorrow, the Fed isn't going to run to the rescue. I just can't imagine Jerome Powell getting in front of everybody and say, oh, inflation's still high. We're going to have to keep those interest rates up. He won't do it. So we are going to see the rate cuts, but it's not going to be because everything is great. It's going to be because we're in the midst of a crisis. So what is gold going to do when that starts to play out? And silver. Let's not forget about silver. Silver rallied as well, uh, and its percentage gain was comparable to gold. In fact, it actually, on a percentage basis, outperformed gold slightly. But Silver still hasn't caught up to gold. You can see that in the silver gold ratio, which is still somewhere in the neighborhood of 88 to 1. You can see that in the fact that uh, gold is still $5 an ounce below its 2020 high, and it's still $25 an ounce below its all time high, even as gold has scaled record levels. So, I've talked before about the fact that silver is significantly underpriced given the supply and demand dynamics. The Silver Institute is projecting a record year for industrial silver demand in 2024, and it's predicting yet another market deficit. I think it'll be the fourth year in a row where demand is actually outstripped supply, so they're, they're tapping into reserves. Silver is not priced to reflect that. So if you believe in the gold bull run. You should also believe in a silver bull run because the truth of the matter is historically silver has outperformed gold in a gold bull market. But the bottom line is this. If this little rally based purely on hope, nothing fundamental or substantive, if it was this big, the rally when the Fed actually delivers rate cuts and those rate cuts are far beyond what anybody today expects, and it relaunches quantitative easing, that's going to send the price of gold and silver into orbit. Now, as I said, this hope for rate cuts, this is the primary reason you're going to hear for this gold rally. That's what the mainstream is talking about. But I don't think that's the whole story. The CPI report for February was not good news for team rate cut. And I'm going to get into those numbers here in a few. But suffice to say, price inflation isn't dead. And as you would expect, gold actually declined on the CPI release because, well, now the Fed isn't going to cut rates soon. And on a side note, you know, it's kind of crazy how sentiment changes based on each little data release. You know, it's day to day. 
Nobody seems to be paying attention, or not nobody, but very few people seem to be paying attention to the bigger picture, the fundamentals, what's going on over the long term. Because as I mentioned, it goes all the way back to 2008 and, and even beyond that. And most people don't have the the patience or the perspective to look at that long term. We're, you know, we're in a 30 second soundbite world. But anyway, gold was down, but it certainly didn't give back all of its gains, right? It was off about 25 bucks, still comfortably above, um, above 2150. So what else might be driving gold higher? Well, I actually talked about it last week. Remember the weaponization of the dollar and the potential for de-dollarization? I think that's a factor in this gold rally. And if you didn't listen to last week's show, check it out because I delve into depth about what I mean by the weaponization of the dollar, what I mean by de-dollarization, and why it is driving, at least supporting the gold market right now. So what I'm saying is I don't think it's a coincidence that gold prices started breaking records not long after U.S. Tre Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen turned heads by pretty brazenly calling for liquidating frozen Russian assets and then using the proceeds to help rebuild war-torn Ukraine. I mean, from the Russian perspective, you'd probably say the U.S. is talking about stealing my money. Now, Again, as I mentioned last week, you may think it's perfectly justified from a foreign policy level, and I'm not here to debate that. But the point of the matter is the rest of the world is watching how the dollar or how the U.S. handles its privilege of issuing the world reserve currency. And I think that some people, many people maybe, are looking at the U.S. and saying, you know, maybe we should be wary of dollars. Maybe we should have less of them. Maybe we should have something else, an alternative. Because I know if you had control over me because of something you controlled that I possessed, I would try to get rid of that thing and get something else. I mean, it's just common sense, right? Now, you might be thinking, well, Mike, that sounds a little bit like a conspiracy theory. Only contrarians and cranks think things like this. I may be guilty of being a contrarian. I may even be a crank. I don't know. But I would argue that it's not unreasonable to conclude that using the dollar as a foreign policy hammer could make countries wary of holding dollars. I mean, that's not out of the realm of possibility, right? It's not crazy talk. But I get why some people might find the idea a little fringe. Nevertheless, similar thoughts have occurred to people more in the quote-unquote mainstream. Bloomberg macro strategist Simon White recently published an article noting that central banks are accumulating gold, quote, in an effort to diversify away from the dollar. He noted two reasons that central banks are abandoning dollars for gold. He said, first, despite the Federal Reserve's efforts, inflation isn't beat. Sounds familiar, right? White points out that, quote, persistently large fiscal deficits threaten to further erode the dollar's real value and lead to more inflation. He wrote, quote, central banks everywhere are quite possibly uneasy about owning too many dollars when the U.S. is running large inflation-causing fiscal deficits. The dollar is structurally overvalued on a purchasing power parity basis versus the main developing market currencies. And he emphasized that the trend is toward, quote, dollar underperformance in the coming years. Speaking of budget deficits, the monthly Treasury statement for February came out yesterday. The Biden administration spent $567.4 billion in February, and they collected $271.1 billion in taxes. Now, doesn't take a math genius to, to hear that and say, uh, seems like we spent a little more than we took in. Uh, and you're right, it gave us a deficit of $296.3 billion. So the deficit was 110% larger than the total tax collections. So yeah, the dollar may be underperforming. You know, could happen. 
And so, again, the rest of the world is watching. And I was talking to a friend of mine today. I don't think that the dollar is going to collapse tomorrow, that all of a sudden we're going to wake up and see this headline, dollar no longer reserve currency. But it's, it's the old adage that things happen slowly and then all at once. There is definitely a trend toward de-dollarization. There are people expressing the view that maybe the world should be a little less dependent on the dollar. And that is bad news for a country that depends on demand for its dollars in order to support its borrowing and spending. So, second thing that uh, White points out is he says countries, particularly those on less friendly terms with the U.S., are watching how the U.S. handles frozen assets, and it's making them nervous. White called the worry about the weaponization of the dollars, quote, the dominant reason central banks are turning to gold. Quote, central banks want gold as it is a hard asset, not part of the financialized system when owned outright. But the dominant reason is a desire to diversify away from the dollar. If you're not on friendly terms with the U.S., then it is a way to avoid your reserve asset being seized, as happened to Russia. So, not a crazy conspiracy theorist, but a crazy conspiracy theorist. This is the Bloomberg guy, right? He notes that central banks are buying gold even as institutional investors continue to spurn the yellow metal with ETF gold holdings dropping. And he says this gives, gives credence to the idea that the fear of de-dollarization and central bank gold demand is helping underpin the price of gold. And I would argue maybe even helping add to this rally as Yellen has been rattling the dollar saber, so to speak. So, again... Bloomberg guy, not some dude with a blog in some dark corner of the interwebs. So I think this is at least something to be aware of moving forward. De-dollarization is going to be a trend to watch in the coming years. So with that, let's look at the CPI data that came out yesterday. Here's how I describe the inflation situation in an article I wrote over on moneymetals.com slash news yesterday. Price inflation is like the gum on the bottom of your shoe that you just can't scrape off. Or if you want a different analogy, maybe it's like a movie theater floor after a big premiere. Remember that? I remember as a teenager particularly walking into the movie theater and it's like you're feel like your feet are sticking to the floor. That's what price inflation is like right now. It's sticky. Now, nobody's going to look at the data that came out this week and panic. It wasn't panic worthy, but it wasn't great either, right? I mean, nobody's going to throw a party. And it's just like that annoying gum residue on your shoe. You just can't shake it off. That's what inflation is doing. It's not killing us right now, but it's definitely still there and it's annoying. And the fact that inflation is sticky should come as no surprise given the amount of money the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government have injected into the economy since 2008. So annual CPI year on year up 3.2% according to the latest data from the BLS that headline number was 0.1% higher than last month. The projection was for CPI to remain unchanged at 3.1%. Now, you did catch what I said. CPI was higher. That means that price inflation accelerated at least slightly from last month. So, not a lot, you know, not up a lot, but up isn't down. I mean, at least not yet. They may get around to redefining up as down, but so far we're not there. And for those of you who might be keeping score at home, CPI was also 3.1% in November. That was three months ago. So it's not like we're seeing this vast improvement in the CPI. Looking at the monthly basis, CPI actually heated up a little more with prices uh, rising 0.4%. Over the last three months, prices have gone up 0.9%, so basically 1%. This annualizes to 3.6%. So the trend, for looking at trends, it appears to be that price inflation is getting hotter, not cooler. Now, excluding more volatile food and energy prices, 
and I say this every time, but you know, I wish I could exclude food and energy prices from my budget. I can't. But we do that for core inflation, and the Fed loves core inflation because those prices are more volatile, so get them out of there. Uh, looking at core, it was also up 0.4% with the annual uh, the core CPI ticking down just a hair to 3.8%. It was 3.9% last month. Now, this core data underscores the stickiness of price inflation because it has been hovering in this high 3, low 4% range since July. And you will notice that all of these numbers remain well above the mythical Federal Reserve 2% inflation target. Now, the Fed claims to be data dependent, right? Well, the data tells us that any talk of inflation's demise is premature. No matter how you slice, dice, or massage these numbers, there's nothing there that indicates the Fed is anywhere near winning this inflation fight. And now for the disclaimer that I give whenever I talk about price inflation, it is worse than the government data suggests. The government revised that CPI formula back in the 1990s so that it understates the actual rise in prices. If we were still using that formula from the 1970s, CPI is actually close to double the official numbers. So if the BLS was using the uh, old formula, we'd be looking at a CPI closer to 6%, maybe higher than that. In fact, I think if we were using an honest formula, it would probably be way worse than that. Here's a case in point from the real world. I saw an article on CNBC today that said home buyers need to earn 80% more in 2020 to afford a house in the current market. And it's not just due to the fact that mortgage rates are higher. The, the costs of houses are still going up. That's price inflation. And the CPI does not capture that adequately. And I've written before, I'll, I'll uh, include a, an article in the show notes page talking about some of the reasons we shouldn't trust uh, this, this CPI formula. But anyway, if you kind of look at the bigger picture, the February CPI data was largely in line with expectations. In other words, everybody knows that price inflation is sticky. They were expecting it. But of course, nobody likes it. So despite the optimism we got from the PCE index a couple of weeks ago, pundits now agree that the current CPI trajectory won't give the Federal Reserve enough wiggle room to cut rates until later this summer, if then. Here's what nobody wants to say out loud. Rates are too high right now for an economy that is loaded with trillions in debt. So as I keep saying over and over again, it's only a matter of time before something breaks. So here's something you want to keep in mind. While slowing the flow of easy money was enough to wreck a bubble economy, and like I said, it's already broken. We're just waiting for it to manifest. It wasn't enough to slay price inflation. The Federal Reserve has not done enough. And that's why price inflation is still sticky. If the central bankers at the Fed were truly committed to driving price inflation back to 2%, which I still don't understand why it's 2%, right? I mean, they're stealing 2% of your purchasing power every year on purpose, but that's an aside, I guess. Regardless, if they were really committed to driving inflation down, they would be talking about additional rate hikes. Nobody would be talking about rate cuts right now. And to reiterate, I've said this before on the show, monetary policy, yes, it is tighter, but it is not tight. Despite all of the jawboning about their commitment to reining in price inflation, the central bankers at the Fed know this. Their own financial conditions index, which is put out by the Chicago Fed, tells them so. The NFCI came in at negative 0.47 in the week ending March 1. That negative number means financial conditions are historically loose. And it has to be because easy money is the mother's milk of this economy. It can't live without it. 
That's why the markets are so desperate for these rate cuts. And the irony is they want price inflation to come down so the Fed can go back to the inflationary policies that got us here to begin with. They want the artificially low interest rates. They want the Fed's big fat thumb on the bond market. They want money creation because it's good for the stock market and it helps with their wealth creation. That, that wealth effect that you get from easy money. And just look at the trajectory of this. I mean, just go back. After the 2008 financial crisis, the Fed slashed rates to zero and held them there, artificially low, for a decade. It launched three rounds of quantitative easing, created nearly $4 trillion out of thin air. It quickly abandoned its marginal effort to normalize monetary policy back in 2018 when the economy got shaky and the stock market crashed. They were already doing quantitative easing again before the pandemic. Then they doubled down during the pandemic. They dropped rates to zero again and injected almost $5 trillion more into the economy. On top of that, you had the government handing out checks The question isn't why is inflation sticky? The question is why is anybody remotely surprised that inflation is sticky given the amount of money creation? And now they just want more of it. And as I said, they're going to get it. That's the headlining act. But it's still a little way down the road. The opening act is still playing on stage. So if this little rally in gold and silver got your attention and you're intrigued by the opening act, you might want to get your seats before the headliner takes the stage because it's going to be a banger. And you're not going to want to be trying to buy gold and silver in the middle of the show. You saw how fast gold went up with, I mean, really nothing fundamental to drive it, just climbing the wall of hope. Gold is going to go up extremely fast when the rest of the world when the mainstream figures out what actually is going on. Because they don't really have a clue right now. They're still in a world of soft landings and inflation is beat. And that world doesn't really exist, only in their heads. So, I highly recommend, take a little time today, call 800-800-1865, talk to a precious metal specialist over at moneymetals.com, let them help you figure out how gold or silver, or both can fit into your portfolio and your investment strategies. All kinds of products available. If you don't want to talk to somebody on the phone, you can go to moneymetals.com. You can chat online. You can buy online. But do it today. Don't put it off. You don't want to buy your fire insurance when your house is on fire because they won't sell it to you. You can still buy gold and silver once the fire starts, but it's going to be more expensive. I would take, especially these little dips, buying opportunities. So that is a wrap for this episode of Money Metals Midweek Memo. You can get more information about everything that I've talked about today and more over at moneymetals.com slash news. And if you want to get the latest news right in your inbox, make sure you sign up, get on our email list. You can subscribe to the Midweek Memo on your favorite podcasting platform. And you'll also get our weekly Market Wrap podcast on Friday. It's a quick wrap of what's happened during the week. And then also, uh, we've been doing some interviews there of some interesting people. So check that out. Really appreciate you listening to the show. Have a great rest of your week.